Hello and good evening everybody and welcome to this discussion event on one of the most important issues facing us as environmentalists and legal experts and practitioners and it's a discussion event on the retained EU law bill and the environment and it couldn't be timelier actually because the bill is being debated and discussed in the House of Commons today in fact at this very moment so welcome to everybody in the room and welcome to colleagues joining via the live stream. We've got over 400 people signed up for this event, which just goes to show how interesting and relevant a topic it is. I'm Ruth Chambers from Greeny UK, the environmental coalition of 10 big environmental NGOs. And we're co-hosting this event today with the UK Environmental Law Association and the UK UCL Centre for Law and the Environment. And a huge thanks to UCL in particular for hosting us today with such generosity. So we're going to structure the event into two halves with two panel discussions, starting off with the first panel, which I'm chairing, and then I'll hand over to Professor Eloise Scottford from UCL, who will lead the second panel. The first panel will be scene setting. There's a lot to think about in relation to retained EU law, so we'll do that in quite general terms. And we've got four excellent speakers and contributors to help us do that. And the second panel will start to look at the bill and its implications and its details um, with a little bit more ferocity. So if you've got questions about the bill, perhaps save them for the second panel. If you've got questions which are more about how all of this is going to work and some of the practicalities, we'll start thinking about those. Um, when we come to the Q&A, put your hand up if you're in the room and we'll do our best to get through as many questions as we can. And obviously, if you can keep your questions reasonably succinct, it means we'll have more time for everybody. If you're joining us online, then you'll be able to use the tool Mentimeter. Um, we've got a magic iPad here, so your questions will appear. And again, we'll do our best to work through as many of those as we can. So that's the kind of order for, um, for this event, um, if, if that makes sense. And our first panel is going to kick off in a minute with Professor Jeff King, from UCL and the Bingham Centre um, for the Rule of Law and he's going to look at the role of Parliament in all of this with particular reference to the sunset and of course Parliament is really at the heart of this bill. It isn't an environmental piece of legislation, it's very much a constitutional bill raising big questions for the role of Parliament and the importance of parliamentary <coughs> scrutiny. So that's who we'll hear from first. Then we'll hear from Dr. Viviane Gravi, who's a, an acknowledged devolution expert. She's from Queen's University, Belfast. She isn't just going to be talking about Northern Ireland implications today. She's going to cover the full aspect of devolution, and there's an awful lot to get through there. Um, then we'll have Becky Shrubsell, who's a director for Constitution at the Department of the Environment. And of course, this event and this discussion today is more relevant for the environment than perhaps any other sector or any other subject. Why? Well, for the simple matter that the great majority of retained EU law belongs to her department, to DEFRA. 570 pieces is the published number, but we know that the real number is still being counted, and the DEFRA secretary has been telling Parliament that it's around about the 1100 mark, so an awful big to-do list for DEFRA. And then finally, David Wolfe Casey from Matrix Chambers is going to think about this through the lens of the Aarhus Convention. What does this mean for us as people, as citizens, and some of the impacts on our rights to participation? So I think that you know, really should make for a fascinating first discussion. I wanted just to say a few more things, just to kind of whet the appetite, if you like, because as I said a few minutes ago, this bill is in live discussion at the moment in the House of Commons. Um, it isn't just a numbers game for DEFRA, because of course the environmental law covered in retained EU law, it covers hugely important areas, um, everything from protecting habitats to chemicals regulation to food to pesticides and so forth. And the complexity is really added to because of the intricacies of many of those laws, the interplay between them, and of course the case law attached to them that's been developed over a great many years. And you'll be pleased to hear that parliamentarians are really interested in this bill. It's not like some bills that perhaps enter Parliament and they seem a little bit niche. They don't have many people standing up speaking about them. 
Well, today I can assure you that the debate in Parliament has been both um, impassioned and at times fiery. It hasn't always been positive, but it shows that parliamentarians have really taken their role of scrutinising um, this bill very, very seriously indeed. I think it's fair to say that some of the debate and some of the discussion has been hampered by, perhaps let's call it, going over old ground. So some of the toxicities of old Brexit arguments still seem to be there and are getting in the way of what should be really careful, considered scrutiny of this important legislation. Um, and then, of course, there's Clause 15, which you know is a part of the bill, which if you're not familiar with it, I'll summarise it briefly. But it's what makes this bill um, actually probably the most damaging thing. And it, it makes the bill a deregulatory bill rather than an improvement bill. And we've been heartened when we've heard different ministers talk about this bill, for example, say that their objective is to deliver improved environmental outcomes and that they have no intention of setting aside the really important protections that the Environment Act and other important legislation give us. But it's difficult for us as environmentalists to see how the current structures of the bill will allow those aims to be delivered. So we hope that that can be brought out in the discussion. And then finally, something about the cost and the impacts. Now normally when bills are published in Parliament, you go to the impact assessment to find out and learn about how much is it going to cost, what impact might it have on business, what does it mean for society. I wouldn't recommend that in this case because the impact assessment is fastidious in its avoidance of doing just that and highlighting those impacts. So organisations have been filling that gap by publishing reports. We've got the Marine Conservation Society report out today about some of the economic costs for the marine environment. Wildlife and Countryside Link has also done um, a similar report today. So there's information that will inform that rich and hopefully very expert scrutiny of the parliamentary process. And after today, the bill will head into the House of Lords. And I know that we've got colleagues from the House and indeed from across government joining us today. So you're all very welcome indeed, whether you're from an NGO, whether you're from a business, a farming organisation, the government legal team, civil society, legal experts, the Office for Environmental Protection. It's a huge list and we look forward to having, hopefully, a very, very good discussion. Thank you for joining. I'm going to hand over now to Professor Jeff King to kick off the discussion with the first presentation. Over to you, Jeff. Thank you very much, Ruth, and, and thank you to the organizers for giving me a chance to comment on this bill. Um, I should open by remarking that the, the report of the House of Lords Constitution Committee on the European Union Withdrawal Act described the powers in that bill then as being a portmanteau of an effectively unlimited powers that was unprecedented and never been seen before. It's my view that this bill goes way farther and Clause 15 in particular is totally unprecedented. It's a far greater concern from a policy and constitutional point of view. So I will be addressing that point, but I will in the main be speaking about the idea of a sunset in this bill and how that relates to the broader idea of sunset clauses, which many people will have heard about, and which are normally a good thing. In this case, they are not a good thing. Uh, this sunsetting, in my view, is not a good thing, and I'll explain why. So what I will we'll do in the few minutes that I have is talk about the first three clauses of the bill in particular, how the sunset operates, how it is related to other sunset clauses, and then look to the clauses that give Parliament power to restate, restate or revoke and replace the very law that is sunsetted by this bill. Now, in speaking about this, I'll be drawing on the submission by uh, colleagues at the Bingham Center for the Rule of Law, Dr. Oliver Garner and Dr. Julian Ghosh, who made a submission to Parliament and is published on the website. It should be available, and there's an excellent analysis there, and I'll, I'll draw uh, to some extent on that analysis, and I contributed to it while they were drafting. So let me begin by describing what the sunset provisions are and what the point of the whole bill is. So the government has stated that the retained EU law revocation and reform bill has two broad purposes. To provide the government with all the provisions required to modify retained EU law. And secondly, to remove the special features that retained EU law has within the UK legal system. 
Now, the view that I have and all colleagues at the Bingham Center is that key parts of the bill go way farther than necessary to do those things, and they tend to come into conflict with rule of law principles at the heart of the Constitution. Let me explain then what the sunset provisions are. They're all contained in the first three clauses of the bill. It's labeled sunsets of retained EU law. Clause one deals with EU-derived subordinate legislation and retained direct EU legislation. I'm not going to try to say what those are, but basically it's the sort of written law that came out of the EU and is applying here right now. There are about 2,400 pieces of it. All of them will be revoked in 2023 by operation of Clause 1 of this bill by the end of the year. So they would need to be replaced or um, revoked. They would need to be replaced if we were to want to continue to have that law, and that creates obvious problems. Now, Clause 2 allows the sunset to be extended by a minister in respect of certain legislation, if the minister so chooses, but that sunset cannot extend beyond the 23rd of June, 2026, and it will need to pass through Parliament. Clause 3 sunsets all of what are called retained EU law rights, powers, and liabilities. These are the kinds of EU law principles that were developed by the European Court of Justice and the Court of Justice for the European Union, the same institution, over the last years, which took effect in, in our legal system by operation of Section 2.1 of the old European Communities Law. So general principles, essentially. These will be gone at the end of 2023, and there's no continuation of them provided for in the bill. No possibility. Now, it's the submission of the Bingham Center, and I agree with it, that this creates an artificial emergency within the UK legal system. If we look back at what the EUA, the EU Withdrawal Act, did in 2018, it was that it allowed Parliament to modify retained EU law at its leisure. It brought all of the EU law into the, domesticated it onto the statute book, and it gave Parliament powers to modify, in minor ways actually, under Section 8 of the, the EUA, to modify that law to fit the statute book. And many of us were concerned at the time that those powers under Section 8 of the EUA would be used to make substantial policy changes. Well, it was actually broadly not used to do that. There were fears of it. Some of us looked forensically for examples, and some examples were found. But broadly, it wasn't used to completely modify the policy landscape. Now, what this bill will do, by contrast, is just delete all of that law with that minor possibility that some of it would be extended. So there's a cliff edge that the substantive law will fall off of. Now, what implications does that have for Parliament? Now, I want to mention that I think it's inappropriate to refer to this as sunset powers. Sunset powers and clauses are well known in legislative practice. They were used in the EU Withdrawal Act, the EUA, in Section 8, to say these powers lapse after two years. We know these are extraordinary powers. They will lapse. In the Coronavirus Act of 2020, there were plenty of sunset provisions, most notably that the whole act would retire, or provisions of the whole act, the main ones, would retire after two years. There was a big parliamentary fight in March of 2020 to ask that there should be continuation votes every six months. So sunset clauses there were pro-democratic and pro-parliamentary. Indeed, the parliamentary glossary that you can find on the UK Parliament's website defines a sunset clause in the following way. A provision in a bill that gives it an expiry date once it is passed into law. Sunset clauses are included in legislation when it is felt that Parliament should have the chance to decide on its merits again after a fixed period. That has nothing to do with what we're seeing in the bill that we're discussing today. Parliament will not have a chance to decide on the merits of repealing these 2,400 pieces of legislation at the end of 2023. To the contrary, it will be excluded from that process, except to the minor extent that I'll come to in a moment. The effect of Clause 1 will be to abolish that range of law. So what will be done to replace it? It's clearly 
not envisaged, obviously, that all of that law will be deleted and nothing will be done to replace it. Well, if effectively, the plan is, is that the law can be restated <coughs> under Clause 12. That is, it can be converted into national law, and you won't call it retained EU law anymore. That's very clear in that clause. Now, there are some concerns here. This is analogous to Section 8 of the, the UA. 2018, where you know you thought, well, what's going to happen when you restate this law? What kinds of changes are you going to make to it? How much policy is going to get into the mix when the government uses regulations to restate the law? Clause 14 tries to cabin the powers to some extent. And so it's a little more similar to Section 8 of the European Union Withdrawal Act. It's possible that it it can be defended as a sort of nip and tuck adjustment so it fits the statute book kind of clause. I'm not saying that it is, but when I look at clause 14, I feel that that's the kind of effect that is being sought. Clause 15, on the other hand, is much more dangerous. Clause 15 says that a relevant national authority, and that means either the UK Parliament or the three devolved parliaments, may by regulations revoke, or the governments that, that need to lay these regulations before those parliaments, may by regulations revoke any secondary retained EU law without replacing it. It also provides in a subsection 2 of Clause 15 that this same authority may by regulations revoke any secondary retained EU law and replace it with such provision as that authority considers to be appropriate and to achieve the same or similar objectives. What does that mean? It means that the governments can propose a new legislative provision that in that government's view serves the same end as the law that is being revoked under Clause 1. Now you can imagine that if you characterize the end as preserving the environment or promoting economic efficiency, there can be a large amount of disagreement about the means for achieving that end the kind of disagreement that you'd want to see in Parliament, the kind of disagreement that would have been discussed in all of the EU institutions that made the adoption of these rules in the first place such a slow and, and consultative process. Well, <coughs> under the clauses of this bill, the process will go through the laying of statutory instruments in Parliament. And now, the, the process of parliamentary scrutiny of regulations of this sort is a notorious, difficult area in the Constitution. It's subject to a review of delegated legislation by the Hansard Society. And essentially, the, the near consensus amongst observers and participants in that discussion is that the system for reviewing regulations is not fit for purpose. They are virtually never voted down. They cannot be amended. Even the affirmative scrutiny process, which is the sort of high bar that in the parliamentary jesting that happens in legislative scrutiny that everyone tries to achieve, oh, don't give it negative scrutiny, insist that parliament has affirmative scrutiny. The effect of that typically is, is that it, the measure will go to a small committee of the House of Commons and be discussed in a short conversation lasting about a half an hour. Then it's approved. And in the Lords, sometimes they'll pass motions of regret but they rarely want to actually tamp down the constitutionally reluctant to do that as an unelected chamber. So this process is no safeguard for vouching for democracy in replacing all of that law. And for that reason, there are very serious constitutional problems with the bill. Indeed, I don't think we've ever seen any, any other bill quite like it before. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jeff. So start to ruminate on some of the, um, the, the collections that will start to emerge. You know, the sunset's not a sunset. This bill is raising huge constitutional issues um, and actually parliamentary scrutiny, even as it's currently configured, is challenging, let alone done through the lens of this bill. Very helpful indeed. Vivian, we'll come to you. And just as we're talking about challenges, we open up the world of devolved impacts. So um, thank you and we look forward to hearing what you've got to say. Thank you, Ruth, and thank you very much for inviting me uh, for this. Um, so I'm going to just start by saying all of what Jeff has said applies for the divorce context. So the problems I'm going to raise are in addition, right? So 
things are even more complex and even more problematic and even less democratic if you consider devolution and especially, um, and I'll talk a bit about it as well, if you consider the specific case of Northern Ireland, you can assume, or you can understand very simply that it is quite difficult to have a government save and evaluate whether we want to keep the law when we don't have a government, right? So it's quite a simple problem for Northern Ireland in many ways. So a first question for me is, to what extent will devolved competence be affected? Now the problem is, we just don't know the extent of retained EU law. We especially don't know the extent of retained EU law in devolved context. The dashboard that we've heard so much about that was published back in June of retained EU law does not cover devolution, does not cover devolved areas. Now that matters because it's actually very complex to map this in a devolved context. First, because the devolution settlements are not the same. So, you know, when it comes to different policy areas, perhaps Northern Ireland will be affected, but not Wales or Scotland. It's going to be different. Second, the transposition history is different. When, you know, for the 20 years where you had devolution and we were still in the European Union, when it came a directive, sometimes the UK government and the devolved administration transposed it as one through one UK SI. Sometimes you had devolved SIs or SRs in Northern Ireland. Sometimes you had primary legislation. Sometimes you had a mix. So we have an example, for example, on the environment side, the strategic um, environmental assessment transposed by, through primary legislation in Scotland through secondary legislation in the rest of the UK. So for Scotland, strategic environmental assessments are not within the scope of this bill. For the rest of the UK, they are. So this already tells you we're moving towards more di intra-UK divergence, which may perhaps not be exactly what the government had in mind. Now, the problem is as well, is we, as we don't have on the central dashboard the devolution uh, role, the question is, do, are the UK government, uh, are the four administrations actually mapping this? You've had some discussion in Northern Ireland until we lost our ministers sometime in October. Um, so the department, so DFI in Northern Ireland had mapped around 500. Uh, DERA, the be the sister department to DEFRA, had mapped around 600. Now that is more than the official DEFRA number. That's normal because in, we don't have a base in Northern Ireland, so climate is under um, DERA. But of course, as we know, the mapping process is still continuing here. Um, and so we know that this is just the tip of the iceberg. And now we also know that both in Scotland and Wales there's been reluctance to put civil servants on the ground to map this because this is not an agenda that is supported by their government. Now, this is a very principled position that we can all respect, but that means that there's an issue there because if these pieces of legislation are not mapped, then there's a quite big risk that they're just going to not be able to be retained because we just don't know they're here, they're there, and they're just going to fall off that cliff by mistake. So, uh, first big question to perhaps add to the many questions we already have, what happens to retained EU law that we just have not identified before the sunset date? Okay, are they assumed to have been retained or are they assumed to have been revoked? Now, what's going to happen how are we going to actually change, retain, revoke, and replace these piece of retained EU law? Um, what's the process? Now, there's two big concerns if you look at what the Scottish ministers are saying, what the Welsh ministers, of course, again, we don't have NI ministers, so they're not saying anything. Um, there's two major worries that they have. The first one is we have powers for ministers of the Crown and powers for devolved ministers to retain, revoke, or replace them. So, Ministers of the Crown do not need the consent of the devolved administration before they start removing, replacing, or restating retained EU law in areas of devolved competence. That means that a UK government ministers can suddenly decide that you know, rules against GMOs in Scotland can be struck. Now, I pick GMOs as a very you know, politicized area, but you ha that can happen across all different areas. We have not had any confirmation by the minister, by the UK ministers that they will not actually use these powers against the wishes of the devolved administration. Now that raises a lot of questions, right? Is it about who goes, who gets there first? If the Scottish ministers restate everything, can then the UK, the UK ministers come after and change things? We don't know. There was a mechanism created around the time the EU was put forward 
to, ha to allow for Welsh and then Scottish ministers to grant consent if there was going to be SIs in devolved areas. Mm -hmm. So we know, I mean, it's not perfect, it doesn't work super well, but it is there. So it is extremely surprising that they didn't even put the effort of reproducing that mechanism. So I think that's, that would be the minimum. Again, it would not work for Northern Ireland because we don't have an assembly or a government to do that kind of checks. Now, the second problem <coughs> is at sunset. Only ministers of the Crown can actually change the deadline, can move it from 2023 to 2026. So that means that we have, for the Scottish and Welsh government, two options. Either they, spend all, they put all of the civil servants in terms of mapping and then restating retained EU law this year, or they have to go and beg London to save their legislation. Now, again, for Northern Ireland, what happens? We don't know. Who is going to do that begging? We don't know. Um, so, especially the problem for Northern Ireland is, are, are we going to then have department, the departments and the civil servants act, actually are going to be in charge of this? Potentially, if that's the case, we would most likely be in a situation, considering how status quo friendly civil servants usually are, in this case, at least in Northern Ireland, would be to just retain things and it, it, it would be the easiest, but will they even have the political cover to do so? So, yeah, um, that is, if you look at the um, amendments put forward by the Scottish Government, these are the two areas that they really want to, to see change. I mean, they want the bill to be struck. But if it continues, they want these two areas to change. Now, I think um, we're going to see a lot of discussion, actually, on the deregulation nature of, the, of this bill later on, and I'm really looking forward to them. From a divergence UK internal market perspective, I think it's really interesting to take a step back and think back about common frameworks, about the Internal Market Act, about the fact that in the Internal Market Act, we have this option, if one part of the UK is going to change the law, and that's going to impact the internal market, you have the, the, the option to ask the CMA to actually come and produce a report and so that you, know, you actually take into account the impact of, on the union. There's nothing about taking into account the impact of repealing part of retained EU law in one nation through this bill. What would this mean for the other nations? So this is very odd. Um, and I think, again, in general, we have the, this problem that we've inherited from the fact that a lot of transposition was done for just simplicity and just to save money was done by through one single UK SI. Does this mean that the case where EU directives were transposed through one SI, can they only then, that SI, only be treated one way? If the UK government wants to repeal it, can the Scottish government actually you know, keep it? And that's going to be one big, big sorry issue. Now, in general, what, I guess from a constitutional point of view, and here I'd say I'm a political scientist, so take, you know, I'm not a lawyer compared to many people on this platform. It's a grain of salt in all of this. Um, it does, in many ways, pit the UK government again against the devolved administration. Once more in this Brexit process, we do see a lot of tension and a lot of disagreement on where to go. This, especially on the environment, because we do have much stronger environmental ambition currently in Wales and in Scotland, sadly, than in London. And so this question here and that regulatory ceiling that we're going to be talking about is something that is really problematic from a Scottish and Welsh perspective. Not that much ambition in Northern Ireland, so it's less problematic there. Um, now, the problem as well is, of course, we've tried so much. There has been a lot of effort in resetting intergovernmental relations in the UK. There's been a lot of effort by the previous government to get us to a position where you're rebuilding trust between the administrations. And this bill, and the Northern Ireland Protocol Bill, does really look like this. It's again undermining that trust. Now, I did say I'm going to say a few words about Northern Ireland, I will. Um, this bill has to be looked at in connection to the Protocol, and in connection to the Protocol Bill as well. Things such as lawyers around the room might be better placed than I to discuss is we have actually all of these beautiful EU principles and this notion of supremacy of EU law is still in the protocol and still actually in the protocol bill for all the areas of EU law that are retained, like that are part of the protocol. So we're going to have at the same time the disappearance of these principles except for the small areas 
of Northern Ireland. Now, I'm from Brittany, where Asterix is from, and I guess we are seeing this kind of, you know, this little map where all of the EU principles have disappeared, apart from this small part of the UK where they're still here. It's not going to work very well in practice. It's going to make, um, you know, legal minds in Belfast very happy, perhaps, to have to poker up. But I don't think in practice it's going to be very, very funny for all of us. Now, the other big thing, and less perhaps quirky, is uh, the impact of North-South cooperation. North-South cooperation is a key part of the Good Friday Agreement. A lot of it in practice on the environment and agriculture, for example, is the fact it is much easier to cooperate if you start from the same regulatory language. We have the same EU regulations, we've got the same EU directives. This is on the basis of that that we can do a lot of work, for example, on cross-border sites and, uh, or, or through the Water Framework Directive. If you suddenly repeal all of these in Northern Ireland, then you remove a lot of that basis for practical cooperation. Now, the North-South cooperation is critical in the Good Friday Agreement. It's also a key part of the Northern Ireland Protocol, and it's part of the Northern Ireland Protocol that is not necessarily supposed to be affected by the bill, the Northern Ireland Protocol bill, but supposed to be reinforced by it. So a lot of questions there. And I think that's it for now. Thank you very much. Thank you, Vivian. And if people want to know more about the dashboard that we're referring to, put into your search engine a Cabinet Office Retained EU Law Dashboard. It'll take you straight to it. It's meant to be an interactive tool. It's not very interactive at the moment. It's a list of the pieces of Retained EU Law that the government has published to date. It's broken down on a department-by-department department basis. And there is meant to be an update coming that adds some new functionality, um, as we understand it, where you'll be able to search um, for new updates, which is quite important. How do you know what's been added since the last time you look? It's not been updated since June. And the Minister for the Bill, Nusrat Ghani, told Parliament today the dashboard will be updated this month. So 13 days and counting for that. So watch this space. Um, Becky, over to you. So Becky, De DEFRA Director, is going to talk about the role of DEFRA in all of this. She's not responsible for the bill. Her department, DEFRA, didn't write the bill. Uh, it started out as a Cabinet Office bill, and now it belongs, belongs to the Business Department, Bayes. So Becky, um, we look forward to hearing what you've got to say. Thank you. Thanks very much, Ruth, and thanks very much, everyone, for having me, um, and also for that kind introduction, Ruth, about the bill. So. I was going to talk to you just a little bit about uh, sort of DEFRA's retained EU law, what we've got, uh, the process that we're going through in the department to think about how we might use the powers. And then I will also just touch a little bit on the, on the devolved uh, administrations and their approach as well, because we are obviously working very closely with them on that. So hopefully that's what you're expecting. Um, so I think uh, in DEFRA, we very much see the retained EU law bill as a sort of continuation of some of the journey that we've already been on with uh, the EU law that we had on some of our key areas. So you'll be aware that since the Withdrawal Act, we have already brought forward really ambitious plans for reform on big, big aspects of, our, of some of our EU law, uh, particularly through the Fisheries Act, the Agriculture Act, and obviously our flagship Environment Act. And obviously, we have also got rid of a number of pieces of retained EU law already, which are redundant and not needed anymore. So you'll see if you do do, as Ruth said, and access the public dashboard, there are 146 pieces of retained EU law, such as sort of legislation codifying the European Fisheries Control Agency, which are no longer relevant to the UK, and so they have already been repealed and that and that's out there for people to look at and obviously we in DEFRA still view the Environment Act as our, our you know our big commitment on the environment our very uh, our absolutely key piece of law um, it obviously sets out new legally binding targets uh, including to halt and reverse nature's decline those targets and the Office for the Environmental Protection are going to ensure that the work that we do around retain DU law is geared to delivering positive environmental outcomes. We have to deliver on our 25-year environment plan. We've got to deliver on the net zero strategy. Um, and I've already mentioned the work that we've got to do on nature as well by 2030. So any of the changes that we think about in terms of environmental regulation or indeed our wider set of regulation has to support those goals.
The government has also committed already to take sort of action to safeguard the substance of uh, any retained EU law that relates to international obligations and our ability to kind of discharge those obligations. Um, and uh, we'll all, we're also going, you know, we, we're absolutely committed to that. We'll demonstrate compliance with non-regression clauses in our trade agreements, including in the TCA. So any decisions that we take going forward on how we use the rule bill powers, either by preserving, repealing or amending the retained EU law, that is not planned to come at the expense of those high standards that we've got. Um, so, uh, much has been said publicly about the dashboard and the volume of the retained EU law that we're dealing with, sort of what is it, what's the extent of it. Um, we've been working very, very hard in the department to try and actually, uh, 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 what's the right word, catalogue all of our retained EU law and everything that falls within the scope of the bill. Um, as Ruth has said, we think that the dashboard will be updated very, very soon. Um, and it's my expectation that that is going to show a significant increase in terms of the number of regulations for DEFRA. I think our Secretary of State said it was going to be in excess of 1,100 regulations. I think that's right, and I think uh, uh, that's where we'll be when you see the refresh of those numbers. Um, I must say that that work you know, is sort of still ongoing. So we are still... Uh, making sure that we have an absolutely precise and accurate record of everything that the bill applies to. And then what are we sort of doing in the department to think about the powers in this bill? So we've said that it's a big priority for DEFRA to review all of our retained EU law. And our biggest priority is to preserve what we need by the end of 2023. So obviously that is a, a huge undertaking for us. And that's our sort of top, top commitment. Um, what we will then do is obviously think about whether there are some areas that we can repeal. So uh, our default approach is going to be preserve unless there's a very good reason to either repeal or reform our retained EU law. Um, but there may be areas where there are irrelevant or redundant legislation that can be allowed either to be revoked using the clauses or can be allowed to sunset. Um, and there may be areas where we do have the opportunity to positively tailor our legislation to reflect uh, us now as a sort of independent nation outside of the EU. And so those are the two sorts of sets of things that we're thinking about when we look at our attained EU law. Where we are thinking of repealing it, or sunsetting it, we've said that we will conduct some proportionate analysis of what the impact of that would be. As I've said, largely we're looking at areas where we have other legislation that's overtaken that or where we don't consider it to be needed any longer. This is obviously a really huge <coughs> programme of work for the department. Um, and we've been working on it really over the autumn. Just an important thing, I think, to say about the dashboard is when we first submitted a return for that dashboard that was published last June, we actually hadn't seen the, the clauses of the bill at that point in time. So another reason that, that our total has ticked up is we weren't aware of the definition of retained EU law that they were using uh, or planning to use as part of the bill. So that will be one of the things that you just need to sort of bear in mind when you see, when you see that dashboard. Um, we are committed to the retain by default approach, um, but that doesn't mean that it's not a, a huge amount to do to actually take action to retain those regulations. Um, we will obviously want to be more specific about specific regulations um, as we move through the work. Um, at the moment, the key sort of commitment that we're making is that we aren't going to, we, you know, it is not our intention to reduce the level of environmental protection currently offered through looking at our rule regulations. Um, one of the challenges is about how many statutory instruments we might need in order to preserve uh, our retained EU law. And that 
uh, is part of the reason we haven't been very specific about what we'll do with every individual regulation at this stage, because the work we're doing in the department at the moment is looking at that, is looking at how do we give effect to the things that we want to deliver through this programme of work, and how can they be sequenced uh, <coughs> between the bill receiving royal assent and between uh, the deadline of the 31st of December 2023. Um, and we are assuming that we will need to, you know, create omnibus instruments in order to give effect to those changes. Um, at the same time, we do remain committed to driving forward our other, the other programmes that the department has to do, because obviously uh, we've got some really key things that we want to do and deliver, including publishing our environmental improvement plan this month. So we don't want to lose sight in doing this work of all the other things that the department is trying to deliver. So there is going to be quite a careful balancing act to strike around how we take forward this legislative programme, which is, is, is really, really uh, significant. Just a sort of word on devolution. I mean, obviously, um, these powers apply, as uh, Vivian has said, to uh, the devolved governments in the same, in for a similar way to they apply to the UK. We do work very, very closely uh, with our colleagues uh, in in the other governments, and we are sharing a lot of information with them at official level. Um, it is a big challenge for all of us. We are trying to do our best to share that. Obviously, DEFRA has 14 common frameworks. We have groups that are already set up that, that meet and discuss how we work together in those policy areas. And those same groups are looking at our retained EU law collectively, thinking about where we can work together, where uh, there are uh, regulations that span across the UK and what sort of approach we might take to working our, our way through this programme uh, collectively. And we also have a very regular ministerial group that meets and discusses this as well. So we have a sort of uh, six to eight weekly meeting of our, our ministers uh, across, uh, across the UK where we, where we talk through um, these issues as well. Um, so I suppose uh, I've tried to give you a sense of the sort of extent and, and the level of challenge um, that uh, we've got in DEFRA, not just around reviewing these regulations, but in delivering you know, our really ambitious and committed programme of work on the environment. Um, that is still something that we absolutely want to do. Um, we are aware that uh, you will want to know more. Um, I hope that as the programme develops, we will get to a point where we can be you know, really, really crystal clear about regulations at this point we are thinking not just about the policy intent, but also the deliverability of this programme of work and how we actually get it to a point where we can be confident that we are going to be able to deliver for uh, the 31st of December 2023. I think that's it from me, Ruth. Thank you very much. Thanks, Becky, and appreciate you coming today when things are sort of in live play, as it were, as well. So we do understand that this is a moving feast. And certainly from an environmental NGO perspective, one of the principles that we've been talking about with the department and are keen to pick up the conversation on after today is the principle of transparency. And the earlier that some of these conversations can evolve and start to be specific, then the better it will be for kind of all concerned, really. Um, for those of you interested in SIs, I think we'll ask the second panel to comment on omnibus SIs and maybe if there are examples of how that's been done and how that's worked, looking in you, at you particularly, Jake, perhaps on that, that, that would be really interesting because omnibus SIs are, are not a common thing that we come across and, and maybe this is something that is really quite novel. And if you're interested in SIs or statutory instruments or these bits of secondary legislation that give effect to powers in primary acts of parliament, then have a look at parliament next week because the statutory instruments that will bring Environment Act targets into law are going to be debated in both the House of Commons and House, House of Lords. So there'll be a good example to see how SIs are actually looked up by parliamentarians. Actually, there's only six or seven of them, and that's presented Parliament with quite a timetabling challenge. So it just kind of goes to show having a big programme of SIs is going to be really difficult for Parliament as well as government. The final contribution of this, um, of this session is from David Wolf Casey from Matrix. Over to you, David, and I think it's fair to say that if anyone is an expert in our use, then it's definitely yeah. you. So 
we'll look forward to what you've got to say. Thank you. Th thank you, Ruth. Um, so um, I'm a jobbing environmental lawyer. Um, concerned with things like environmental impact assessment and the habitats regulations, um, EIR uh, and GMOs, things like that. So very much in the frame of wanting to understand um, where we're going to be sitting in a year or two's time. Um, Jeff's introduction makes me think that we are in a sort of um, uh, 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 precipitous way driving towards a cliff with the possibility that there's a safety net that will catch us. There are all these mechanisms, most of which seem to begin with R, revoke, replace, retain, whatever it may be, that could constitute a safety net. In that context, um, I'm very reassured, I have to say, by hearing what Becky's just described. But I'm slightly puzzled and slightly alarmed that other people may have heard that before, but at least for me, that came as a surprise, albeit a pleasant surprise. Um, I want to just put that into the context, my pleasant surprise, into the context of, um, first of all, the Aarhus Convention, but also what the, um, the EU-UK uh, uh, Trade and Cooperation Agreement says about the process of regulatory change. Um, what you've got on the screen, um, and I'm not going to grind you through it in a sort of barristerial kind of way, every word uh, by word, um, are the provisions of Article 8 of the Aarhus Convention. Um, we've litigated or we've complained about all sorts of other provisions of, our, of the Aarhus Convention, about all sorts of other things, but Article 8 has gone largely um, uncommented upon um, until quite recently. I have the privilege of acting for Friends of the Earth in a complaint to the Aarhus Convention Compliance Committee um, about the Article 8 compliance of the EU Withdrawal Bill. So this is all, um, in a sense, very topical. Um, and set, in essence, what Article 8 requires, at least this is Friends of the Earth's case and it certainly hasn't crashed and burned before the Aarhus Compliance Committee, is consultation, public consultation, um, on the draft text of legislation, including primary legislation, that is being contemplated by a, a national parliament. Um, people are supposed to be able to comment on what is being proposed and have their comments taken into account. There's a fairly robust decision um, of the Aarhus Compliance Committee um, in relation to the provisions of the Slovakian process, um, which is quite rich in terms of its public consultation. Slovakia um, successfully defended the complaint. You can see why when you look and see how rich their uh, uh, processes for public consultation on draft legislation are. Now, um, the UK has made various arguments about why this didn't apply to the EU withdrawal bill. One of those um, focuses on the words within Article 8 um, that these obligations for public consultation only apply um, where their provision in question may have a significant effect on the environment. May have a significant effect on the environment. You see that in line four of the text. Now, what the UK has argued in relation to the EU Withdrawal Bill is that doesn't apply to the EU Withdrawal Bill because, of course, the EU Withdrawal Bill simply rolled forward all of the existing provisions of the Habitats Directive and the Birds Directive and so on. So there's an argument to say um, that the EU Withdrawal Bill indeed, on its face, didn't have or wouldn't have that effect. Now, assuming, as I'm doing for the purpose of this conversation, that Friends of the Earth succeeds in that argument, um, uh, in its argument in relation to all of those things, Let's now roll that same concept forward to look at this bill. Um, what does the safety net look like? And the answer is, all we have, and I don't mean to diminish it because um, it seems to be very significant, are Becky's reassurances. We don't have, we don't have um, provisions in the bill equivalent to those in the EU withdrawal. Indeed, that's the very point of the bill, isn't it? That's the very point of the bill. So it seems to me, um, if Friends of the Earth succeeds in its complaint in relation to the EU withdrawal bill, then there's an even stronger complaint to be made in relation to this bill. Of course, it doesn't help us as citizens in the current moment, because this is what's happening. Any complaint will be very much after the event. But what it seems to me we have is a fairly obvious and quite likely to succeed complaint about the UK's Aarhus approach to this act of deregulation. The second thing I want to talk about is the Trade and Cooperation Agreement. So this is the agreement between the UK and the EU. Again, it has interesting provisions dealing with the process of changing your regulation, including expressly your environmental regulation. So, of course, um, we can have a long discussion about how enforceable this would be by citizens and all the rest of it, but this is the commitment that the UK has made to the EU in terms of how it would go about acts of deregulation um, in relation to any area across the spectrum of, of, uh, of retained EU law. And interestingly, unsurprisingly perhaps, there's a commitment, Article 346, to public consultation. A commitment to publicly consult on deregulatory measures um, with your citizens. Within that, not just the general pro proposition, but 
the specific obligation is to publish either the draft regulatory measures or consultation documents, and this is the important bit, providing sufficient details about the regulatory measure under preparation to allow any person to assess whether and how that person's interests might be significantly affected. So our commitment to the EU is to publish information which allows anybody in this room to know how they might be affected. Um, that simply hasn't happened. That simply hasn't happened. We're reliant on Becky's welcome uh, uh, assistance. Um, the other thing that Article 3, 4, that, that the um, TCEU requires is an impact assessment. So impact assessment for any major regulatory measure, um, and that has to expressly include, to the extent possible and relevant, information on the potential dot 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 environmental impact of the options. I'm missing out a lot of text, but you get the sense of it. So. Imp imp impact assessment. Now, Ruth has already to some extent stolen my thunder on this point because the only impact assessment I can find, and it sounds it's like the same one that Ruth has found, is the one um, on the parliamentary website, headed impact assessment, which essentially tells you how many regulations there are in play um, and not a great deal more. It certainly doesn't have anything on its face which gives you an assessment of the environmental impact of this bill. Indeed, one says it can't, can it, because of the very problems we've got. So um, we are left in this enormous um, constitutional international law difficulty where the very things that we're supposed to be told about the bill, um, we are not being told and, and perhaps can't be told. The only inference we can draw, it seems to me, which is quite interesting, and perhaps this gives some foundation for my uh, confidence in what Becky's saying, is... Um, in the impact assessment, there's a specific provision, specific standard question, I think it's a standard question in impact assessments, is this measure likely to impact on international trade and investment? And the answer, quite tantalisingly, is NA, not applicable. Okay? Now, um, so it doesn't say no, it's not likely to, it says not applicable. Now, I mean, you know, obviously, what does that, what does that mean? Because it's clearly, plainly capable of impacting on international trade, because it's clearly possible that there will be, um, that Becky's um, enthusiasm is not borne out, perhaps in other departments, if not in DEFRA, um, and we won't get the continuity that Becky's describing. So hard to see how that really works. So it seems to me we have a whole series of um, grievances as citizens, um, picking up on, on, if you like, the legal theory um, grievance that, that Jeff has articulated so fully. We have grievances as citizens about our lack of public participation in this very process. Now, you might say that's inherent in the bill. That's the whole point of the bill. It's meant to make it easy to change environmental law. But that doesn't take away what seems to me to be a really fundamental um, uh, democratic deficit, not just for parliamentarians, which is what we were hearing about before, but also for us as all these ordinary citizens who should be able to look over the cliff and know what the safety net looks like and realise that the safety net, as Becky Riley describes it, is not full of holes. We are going to be safely caught as we drive over this cliff. I hope that's right, but we don't have the mechanisms to give us that reassurance. Thanks, Ruth. Thanks, David. So we're going to move to questions now. I'm hoping that we can run for 15 to 20 minutes on, on time. I'll, I'm sure I'll be told if that's um, eating too much into the second session. We'll start in the room. Um, please keep your questions quite succinct. Introduce yourself, and then we'll come to the Mentimeter and gather questions up. Um, Becky's very kindly offered, if there are any factual clarification questions, she'll do her best to answer those, but she's not going to be an active panel member just because of the live state of play so hopefully that makes sense but she's going to gather any questions that are DEFRA specific and take them away and, and share them with colleagues I think that's right so um, let, let's come to you first and then you Stanley please uh, Hi my name is Ewan Bidaki from King's College London Law School thank you so much um, the trade and cooperation agreement has non-regression uh, articles later on uh, but very clearly for uh, employment law for environmental law, uh, tax standards. Um, so the, the sunset clause uh, all, almost certainly is, is going to, I mean, if, if, if Jacob agrees, Morgan, Therese, Coffee uh, don't decide to uh, replace pretty much everything on environmental law, uh, then the trade and cooperation agreement is uh, violated. And, and so this, this whole bill, uh, like the minimum strike uh, service uh, this bill, is uh, just a big violation of our international obligations. So I'll summarise briefly just so everyone can hear. So basically the question is about the link between the sunset and the trade and cooperation agreement and the impact that this bill will have if it remains unamended on our international obligations. 
So hold that one, panellists, for now. Um, Stanley? Thank you very much. Background. I've had quite a lot of history in the European Commission, European Parliament, on the environmental law. Also, I'm aware of that. Um, there's a 700 page book called The Environmental Policy of the European Communities, which I wrote with Geek or so, rivaled only by Nigel Hayes' book <laughs> on the environmental policy. Now, here's, the, here's my question. Chairman, Chair, um, you said when this bill goes forward. I don't think we should necessarily assume that this bill will go forward to the House of Commons. I don't, sorry, to the House of Lords. I don't know what the vote is going to be uh, tonight. But I, I raise a point. Since at least two of your panelists have express real doubt about the constitutionality of the bill. And I remember Jeffrey Charles brilliant, brilliant speech in the, in the Rothschild lecture on this point. Um, is it not conceivable that either an individual, some Gina Miller figure, or, for example, a coalition of UCL, um, UKLA, and the Bingham Centre, <laughs> might go to the House of Lords, or the, you know, it's not the House of Lords, anymore, <laughs> and say, look, Actually, I know you would prefer uh, to give a ruling when something's actually happened. But in this particular case, we're worried that something is about to happen. In, at a lower level, you have courts which say, well, you can't have that in mind because that's going to interfere with the, you know, the government's climate policy. So my question is, is there not a third way? Even if the bill goes through today, obviously the third way might be to stop the government somehow, but that's another matter. If you can't stop the government, can we not have a, 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 a view of the House? Uh, the Supreme or some other judicial form. And I could easily see a case for you three getting together to do that. One very criminal point, and I think I'll pick up Betty's point, having been very heavily involved in the Habitat Space and not other objectives, it is absolutely clear to me that that vast network of sites, which was defined and adopted in all four countries of the, Europe, of the, of the, of the UK as a result of the Habitat Space, incorporated in um, the UK Habitat Regulation 2017, that will only survive if that regulation and its rules survive. And so it's very reassuring to hear from you that you are committed to retain our international obligations. And by the way, we have had that precise assurance also from uh, Therese Coffey and, 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 and um, Lord Goldsmith. But that's only, <coughs> that's only a tiny example. But for us, it's a very important example if I was in. In Thanks, Stanley. Very good. Yeah. And yeah. It's perfectly clear. If you don't retain those networks of sites, there's no way you leave off Thank you. Really Thank important you. point. So the question from Stanley Johnson is about the constitutionality of this bill, and is there another route to challenging that, yeah. perhaps through a judicial route? Um, David, can we come to you first, either on the TCA or the constitutionality angle? Take your pick. Well, I think I think um, the point that was made there was that the TCEU has a non-regression clause, and surely, therefore, this is in contravention of that. Um, and I, mean, I think that's quite a lot of um, thinking about whether you can anticipate breaches of non-regression clauses. And I'm not getting into the detail of that, but but in a sort of proof of a pudding kind of world, presumably, if Becky's team does but Becky, Becky's. Um, hoping, hopefully encouraging us to do it, I don't want to pin her down too hard, um, then, then there won't be non-regression. I mean, Becky specifically said, you know, we're, we're observing non-regression obligations. So at the end of the day, we would have gone through this tortuous process and all lost a lot of sleep. And Becky would have you know, worked very hard to get us back to where we started. And that would be great. <laughs> Could you just add to that? No, um, it's been a long time since I read the TCA, but... From what I remember, the non-regression clause is all about trade, mm. and it's about if you have a demonstrable impact on trade. Now you can re you can weaken environmental regulation without perhaps meeting that threshold of having that demonstrable impact on trade. So I think we can, you know, I don't think we can trust the TCA, even though it has more on the environment than most trade deals, to you know be that impactful. Unless you start, yes, if you start slashing everything and removing everything, yes, I think it's likely you're going to have a demonstrable impact on trade, especially if you start doing that more on employment rights, on workers' rights. But, you know, I think it's, it's really important to not trust the TCA to just in, that, in this context. I think. Do you want to add anything, Chair? Sure. Um, I agree um, with what David said about the non-aggression clause. It, it, the bill itself, I don't think you can say, is plainly a violation. It would have to be whether the replaced, replacement law violates it, and, and that would have to be a case-by-case -case analysis. 
Um, also, those clauses are a bit vague. I remember um, when looking at them, I can see why you'd say there's debate about how justiciable they might be. Um, they're deliberately constructed to be a little bit vague, I'm sure at the insistence of the UK government when they were adopted. Um, and, and so, Stanley, on, on the possibility of challenging this, this bill in the courts, it's at the moment they haven't really done anything except brought a bill to Parliament, so it's a proceeding in Parliament. The courts wouldn't go near it because it's an Article 9 Bill of Rights issue that you don't challenge those things in court. Once the bill became, becomes law, and I think it probably will, then it's pretty clear at what it's trying to do. And I think that even the Supreme Court, prior to its, its um, let's say, shift towards more executive-minded uh, approaches in its jurisprudence, wouldn't probably have been willing to even read down these provisions uh, in a very striking way, so, let alone stop it altogether. So I'm really not confident that the Supreme Court will provide the solution. Really, the constitutional principles that, that are at stake are ones that we kind of fight for under the political constitution in the, in the regime that exists here. Thanks, Jeff. De definitely one to pick up over wine and nibbles in about an hour, a very important issue. I'm going to go to an online question now. It's about the devolved impact. So I'll come to you, Vivian, on this. Um, I'm going to reframe the question. I'm sorry, I don't know who's asked it. Um, and the questioner is saying, as environmental law is generally devolved, will the bill affect devolved nations differently? Will it cause issues for devolution? I think you pretty much covered that. But an addendum I wanted to put to you is, what about the opportunity costs for the devolved administrations in terms of their aspirations in our current context for the environment, but also for lots of other things as well? Would you be able to comment on that? Yeah. Um, I think you're right. I mean, opportunity cost is really the central issue, well, one of the central issues for devolved administrations. You've got the big constitutional questions, but you have the fact that each administration in the UK had their own policy agenda. Scottish and Welsh government had plans for 2023. If the retained EU law passes, all of these plans will have to be put on ice to catch up and to do, uh, you know, to deal with retained EU law. Now, as and then as I mentioned before, you know, if, even if there is discussion, um, it happens differently across the department. You always have different opinions. So what's very likely to happen is that we are not going to have exactly the same approach taken on each of these pieces of um, retained EU law across the UK. So we're just going to have more divergence uh, come the end of 2023 than we currently have. Thank you. We'll come back into the room now. So, any questions from the room? So, um, David Baldock and then Sandy, and then we'll come back to an online question. Uh, thanks, Ruth. It's David Baldock from IP. And I just want to see whether Leanne and the panel agree with me that in relation to the TCA, the test is whether it distorts trade and investment. And you have to demonstrate that through some kind of evidence base. So it's not as sort of necessary a prima facie, you know, to compare legislation exercise. It's, it's, it's an evidence-based time. So what we're doing here um, is actually creating another layer of uncertainty. It, it will not be clear whether it's any new measures compatible with non-legislation. So the question, just so everyone could hear it, is about the TCA test and whether or not the panel agree it's about trade and investment and it should be evidence-based, and if so, will it lead to further uncertainty? Um, Sandy? Yeah, Sandy Look from the Marine Conservation Society. My really big worry in relation to the retained EU law bill is the number of laws that it actually covers. <coughs> because at the moment we understand there might be 4,000 or so, we understand there is 1,100 plus um, that DEFRA is looking at. But when I went to the government website um, the, that lists all legislation, it said that there were 160,000 roughly pieces of EU legislation. Now I know lots of them are different and their decisions and their pride and their don't apply, to, but 160,000 and there were, I, I can't now remember the exact number of environmental directors but a lot and I found it impossible to try and find out how many laws there are and I'm really worried that if the 
if the sunset clause applies, we will lose laws that we don't even realise until we suddenly realise later on that there's a gap. And that will have massive follow-on effects on all the existing legislation that there still is. Thanks, Sandy. So the question from Sandy is about just how many laws are we dealing with? Um, if you look on legislation.cov.uk, there are 160,000 EU laws, although not all of them are retained, but how many of them are there? What if we miss them? What if we lose those down the accidental back of the sofa scenario? Really important question. Um, who would like to comment on the TCA question, David? Well, so so um, your, your point is entirely right, which is the non-regression clause um, we've been talking about is in relation to the impact on international trade and investment. Um, uh, and so the argument, the question before about whether that was going to be problematic, I think that's the threshold test. But just to go back to what I was talking about in my opening, which is Article 347 and the impact assessment. So the impact, so the process of consultation that I was talking about isn't only on things that will have an impact on international trade investment, it's on any deregulation, major deregulation. And one of the things the impact assessment is required to include is the information to the extent possible, the potential dot dot dot, including the impact on international trade and investment. So that recognises that the impact assessment and the consultation has to take place even if you don't cross the threshold of potential non-regression. And indeed the issue of potential non-regression is one of the factors that you're supposed to be consulting and informing on. So the procedural bits that I was talking about as opposed to the substantive failure non-regression <coughs> question um, is clearly at the general threshold and it seems to be clearly in play here. And the number of laws question, um, Vivian or Jeff, do you want to take that conundrum? Well, I, um, I mean, I, I, I've used legislation.gov.uk countless times. I'm, I'm not. It's, it can sometimes return figures that um, that are that are accurate according to your query, but your query might not be asking the right questions. And so far as understanding this, I don't know where the precise information. I followed the explanatory notes of the bill, which say that it's about 2,400 pieces of legislation. If DEFRA is talking now about 1,100, I'm assuming that number will be inflated somewhat. But really, it doesn't matter. I mean, that, those numbers alone create the kind of cliff edge that I'm talking about. If DEFRA has to replace 1,100 regulations in, a cal in a less than a calendar year, and in the process make decisions about whether some of them need replacing at all, I mean, that is an incredible amount of legislative activity and of policy decisions that need to be done. And it can't be the case that even the minister will be able to consider all the relevant policy considerations in that time frame. So it's a, it's a Herculean task. I'm, I wish you well for it. I think just what, to add to this, um, I think to go back to this, this idea of artificial emergency that you were talking about earlier, by creating this artificial emergency, then suddenly, of course, you don't have time for public participation. Of course you don't have time for consultation. We've got this deadline. We don't have time to speak to people. We have to do it within, within the house. And you know, that's when things happen. I mean, we know through the SIs and the SRs that have created retained EU law, you've had 100,000 amendments to EU law to make it into retained EU law. A lot of things have fallen mm -hmm. through already. We've had weakening of standards already. And so this is about adding another layer of without yeah, but doing it over nine months instead of three years. We have no more time for questions, I'm afraid, so it's a good time to leave it with hands in the air, but don't put them down entirely because we're going to pass you over to the second panel and seamlessly change seats. But in the meantime, thank you to the speakers on the first panel. We are going to move swiftly on to the second panel. The break comes at the end. Um, I am Professor Eloise Scottford. I am uh, a member of the faculty at UCL Laws um, and co-director of the Centre for Law and Environment. Um, I uh, am delighted to chair this session on the detail of the bill. Just in case you felt like you hadn't actually learnt much about the bill, you have. There was a lot of detail <laughs> about the bill in the first, but we're going to we're going to dig even deeper. Um, uh, I will quickly introduce the panellists and then we will get into presentations and then hopefully leave, leave as much time for questions, um, which there were still, I can see lots of questions from the first panel which can be asked at the end of this session as well. So first I would like to introduce Jake White, who will speak first, um, who's the Head of Legal at WWF. He's been that since 2019. 
um, and has held senior roles at Friends of the Earth and the Equalities and Human Rights Commission. Um, Jake will be speaking about revocation, replacement, deregulation, uh, non-regression, all of the R's in various combinations. Um, then uh, we have Ned Westaway, who is a uh, barrister at Francis Ted Building Chambers, chairman of UK's Board of Trustees, um, very highly ranked as a junior in environmental law, um, and does all sorts of wonderful work um, in environmental law. Ned will be speaking about, which we haven't really got into yet, the environmental case law um, aspects of the retained EU law bill. Um, and then, last but not least, is Professor Maria Lee, my colleague, who is a Professor of Environmental Law at UCL Laws, directed the Centre for Law and Environment for over a decade. Um, amongst many interests in UK and EU environmental law, she has done an incredible amount of work on the implications of Brexit for environmental law, including um, on being a member of the Green UK Brexit Scenarios Group and Associate of uh, Brexit and Environment. And Maria will be speaking on principles, of supremacy, restatement, the environment, everything to do with the detail of the bill. Um, that, uh, so without further ado, I, I may wash up with a few reflections if there's anything left to say, um, uh, and we'll see how we go. But, uh, and, and I will, yeah, you've got your timekeeping, and I'll keep an eye on that too. But Jake, over to you. Thanks, Louise, um, and good evening, everyone. I think you, I'm going to focus most of my remarks on Clause 15. Um, I think you've already heard quite a bit about it. I think it is a very real concern, uh, Clause 15 of the bill. Um, we're going to, I'm going to walk very, very briefly through its key provisions, which I think because I think you've already heard about them, and because you've already heard quite a few of the, of the risks and concerns, I'm going to try and sort of be brief about those too. I think to kick off, the bill is often presented, for example, by Cabinet Office as an enabling bill that it gives these powers to restate, to, to re, re, reproduce, to, uh, to amend. Um, I think there were some pretty solid arguments against that, the sunset clause, the abolition of principles, the abolition of supremacy of EU law. But I think the clause, clause 15 issue sort of cements the view, essentially, uh, to my mind at least, that this is, this is far from being an enabling bill. It's a very, very broad power to rewrite EU secondary legislation, and it's exercisable until the 23rd of June 2026, so that 10 years after that referendum, you'll recall. The key elements, briefly, the first is a power to revoke any piece of secondary retained EU law without replacing it. Just hold that in your mind for a sec. So that's revoke at will with no replacement, okay? That's sub one. Sub two is revoke and replace with a, effectively a similar provision. So that's more like a like for like. The third element is perhaps the most worrying in many ways, which is revoke and make such alternative provision as the authority considers appropriate. So uh, that's not necessarily linked back to the original subject matter. That's a power to make any provision you want. Yeah, keep that all in mind. There is a proviso. The proviso is that the overall effect in a particular subject area does not increase regulatory burden. And the definition of burden is taken from the Legislative and Regulatory Reform Act 2006, um, inspired by Richard McCrory, and late of this parish, um, and essentially focuses on the idea of financial cost, um, obstacles to efficiency, but introduces an additional element, uh, which is obstacle to trade or innovation. Whilst constraints on the power are clearly welcome, I think there is a very real risk, as we've heard from Ruth Chambers and others, that the regulatory burdens test will, in, a, in practice, um, ensure that the power is, has to be used in a broadly deregulatory manner. Why? First, I think because the provision introduces uncertainty about how burdens are assessed. See, for example, my air quotes around particular subject area. Second, because burdens are inherently uncertain and difficult to quantify, as I think it's probably fair to say government found out when it put together its own impact assessment. And third, because departmental lawyers will always take a cautious approach to avoid essentially the risk of successful JR. This is all very problematic when looked at from an environmental perspective. First of all, because administrative inconvenience is all but an inevitable consequence of new regulation as you switch from one regulatory process to another. Second, because the upfront cost of environmental investment may well be quite high, even if the levelised cost over the course of, say, the life of a particular, a, a particular asset can be quite low. What time frame will these costs, therefore, be, be assessed over? Third, I mentioned subject area. How exactly does one define this? At what stage is this netting off assessment about what the overall contribution, the overall effect on regulatory burdens is undertaken? Fourth, 
joined up government. We're going to need some pretty joined up government if we're going to undertake this overall burden assessment. Um, see, for example, the incidence of air quality, where DEFRA and the Department of Transport may be pulling in rather different directions. Concerns. It's very difficult to see a justification for such a wide-ranging power, even pending the end of 2023. There's no indication, as we've heard, on the face of the bill as to which power is appropriate in which circumstance. In other words, when would you exercise the power to revoke at will, with no replacement? When would you exercise those other two powers that I mentioned? It gives essentially ministers an unlimited discretion in this regard to decide which of those powers to use. And as we've heard, because of the 2023 uh, cutoff, there's no time to properly consider which you're going to use. Second, I struggle with the justification for the existence of this power following the end of 2023. Parliament in the bill lays down a structure under which this very rushed, very strange uh, process of moving across or revoking EU legislation is to take place. Yet this power that we mention is exercisable up until the end of 2020, sorry, until the 23rd of June 2026. It's almost as if Clause 15 admits that the 2023 cutoff is unachievable. It's a bill beset by its own contradictions. Even if we assume that it's right that this power should be, that, sorry, that it's right that the 2023 date is, is unachievable, it's very difficult to see what justification there could be, in particular for this power to make regs uh, unconnected to the original policy aim. Are those types of decisions not fundamentally for Parliament? Are those not very redolent of primary legislation? Even if this were justifiable, it's very difficult to see the logic for focusing on one particular body of legislation, which depends essentially entirely on its origin, i.e. that it came from Brussels, not on its purpose, not on its effect, not on its subject matter. The power is not as tight to necessity, not as tight to the necessity of Brexit, as is, for example, Section 8 withdrawal act, as we heard from Professor King earlier. Although this is, a, in some senses, a more wide-ranging power in the sense that it, gives minister, it gave ministers the power to amend primary legislation, it was, in fact, more constrained because it focused on the failure of retained EU law to operate effectively or any other deficiency. There, is, there are no such constraints in Clause 15. Contrast again Clause 14 of the Rural Bill. This contains relatively sensible constraints on the powers to re restate and reproduce retained EU law, despite the fact that those, those powers are inherently less damaging or less harmful to what's already on the statute book. The definition of burdens. I've mentioned this already, but I just want to make a brief, part, brief passing mention to environmental harms. How are these to be accounted for in relation to when assessing a cost, undertaking a cost-benefit analysis? I think, as we've heard, the deregulatory thrust of, of, of Clause 15 causes tension with the level playing field provisions of the Trade and Cooperation Agreement. This is implemented, you'll recall, into UK law thanks to the EU Future Relationships Act 2020, Section 29. Government would, it seems to me, probably argue that because you take this slightly more globalised um, view of regulatory burdens, see particular subject area, the overall substance, the overall effect is to keep burdens at the current level. Yet, as we've heard, Clause 15 all but guarantees a deregulatory measure because if a deregulatory use, because if one measure increases burdens, another has to reduce. Um, where that is impossible, clearly the power cannot be used. I think in the environmental context, this is particularly problematic because we're all aware of very significant, as we heard from Stanley Johnson earlier, very significant pieces, individual pieces of EU retained law in the environmental space, which confer very important protections and are at risk from the very, very wide powers in the bill. See, for example, the habitats and, and regulation, the habitats regulations. I've mentioned the Legs and Regs Act, Legislative and Regulatory Reform Act. It's worth recalling that this, bill, this power goes significantly further than the power in Section 1 of the Legislative Reform Act, because that power, is more, that, that power is more narrowly constrained for use for the purpose of removing burdens. The burden test here is a negative one. In other words, the power is exercisable, provided it doesn't increase burdens. Uncertainty. I think, again, we heard from Professor, Professor King on this point. Certainty is quite clearly the cornerstone of the rule of law, and the bill in this respect is deeply problematic. It's an incredibly broad power. After 2023, we see another three years of potential un and uncertainty and distraction for Whitehall from the day job. Um, we will see a further three years of temptation on the part of ministers to rewrite the statute book.
As we've heard, there's nothing on enhanced scrutiny or consultation that one might expect uh, for such a wide-ranging power. And we've also heard on the devolution aspect as well. It's certainly possible to foresee difficulties under the Internal Markets Act and the mutual recognition principle, for example, that it envisages. So to round off, um, it seems to me these, these, these clauses, and, and Clause 15 in particular, are a big distraction for Whitehall from the much more pressing matters that it has at hand. In particular, for the purposes, I think, of this discussion, delivering on its very ambitious environmental commitments, which are incredibly pressing. It brings the risk of significant re regressive change to environmental regulation, and it's very difficult to see the logic for these powers, given, as I've said, the almost complete absence of steers on the face of the bill as to how they're going to be used. As comforting as, of course, it was to hear from, from the DEFRA director earlier as to how they might be used in practice. These clauses grant the executive, executive further very large powers to rewrite whole areas of legislation based solely on, as I say, where that legislation originated. It creates considerable uncertainty for business and the wider public, and it sidelines Parliament and signals no additional scrutiny for wider society. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jake. That was very, very helpful and built nicely on the discussion in the first panel as well. Um, Ned, I'm going to swiftly move over to you. Thanks, Eloise. I've produced some slides which have been hanging around behind Jake's head, I'm afraid. <laughs> um, but I'll keep it relatively high level. I think I'm not really talking about the front line here. The front line is probably the sunset, clauses, clause 15. Um, but it's a really important line on what happens to retained EU case law and I suppose if we conceptualise it, we're thinking about what happens to the law that might be restated or reproduced, effectively retained by any other name, because we're moving away from the language of retained, um, and what the courts then might do and indeed are being asked to do. So in legal terms, Brexit wasn't really so much an unfrozen moment as a moment of freezing, freezing um, as of a certain date, 31st December 2020. And when we say retained EU case law, that's what we're talking about. Case law that somewhat happened to have been decided um, by that date by the Court of Justice of the European Union. And it includes principles or decisions. So um, retained EU case law, I like the acronym given the location we're in. Um, <laughs> Is, is just that, CGAU decisions, um, but also the bill includes reference to retained domestic case law, which is important because that's where the domestic courts have applied EU law and, have applied, and it, it, it also, to some extent, has an effect on those. Um, so I, I think I can jump on. Uh, I want to talk about the current position briefly and then come on to the core provisions in the bill. Um, the current provision was set out in Section 6 of the Withdrawal Act and effectively um, as supplemented by those 2020 regulations, the higher court, Supreme Court or the core appellate courts um, were not bound um, by principles laid down. So this has already happened. They're not bound by CJU decisions, but it's subject to um, some safeguards. Um, and the law actually says they may have regard to post-Brexit CJU case law. Um, the two um, caveats to it are that, um, firstly, um, the subsection doesn't prevent the validity, meaning or effect of retained EU law that's been modified. So in a way, this is subject and six, and I think it's quite important if one looks at what we already have, the law already recognises the ability of government to make new law, modify existing law, and that will already have an impact on the extent to which retained EU case law bites. And the second caveat is, um, as far as uh, the existing case law is concerned, is that the, um, these higher courts can depart from um, retained EU case law. Um, and there's effectively the existing law said that the test that applies in those circumstances is the same test as the Supreme Court would apply if it was departing from its own case law. Um, so that's, that's already there as well. Um, that is a very sparingly used power. So the House of Lords and the Supreme Court don't often depart from their own case law. And I think it's telling to just observe that it's not enough that the Supreme Court considers that previous House of Lords or Supreme Court authority is wrong. 
needs to be that they consider it's positively right for good reasons to depart. Um, so what's been the experience today? We've had a couple of years of um, this existing regime and I think in short there's been few serious difficulties. Perhaps one of the reasons for that is we haven't really had any serious attempts to change the existing framework of environmental law at least that comes from the EU. So we found that in environmental cases the courts have tended to apply retained EU case law fairly straightforwardly and I list some various cases there that relate to various aspects. Um, the Keir decision is interesting because that was an advocate general opinion where I don't think there was a final court of justice decision but nonetheless the court effectively applied the advocate general uh, opinion. The case that I think stands out as the most important reference point for us as to how things apply at present is TuneIn and Warner. It's not environmental, it's an infringement of copyright case. And the key issue there was the meaning of the word communication to the public. That had been um, discussed in as many as 25 Courts of Justice decisions, one of which um, post-dated Brexit. Um, and TuneIn perhaps ambitiously argued that the court should depart from the entire body of case law on communication to the public. That was rejected fairly soundly by the Court of Appeal. Um, and eight reasons were given, but it's worth dwelling on some of them. First of all, um, Lord Justice Arnold said there was no change in the domestic legislation. So the legislation was the same. Logically, the case law um, has some application to it. Secondly, there was no change in the international framework. So like so many areas of EU law, there's a behind it a bigger international framework. And in environmental law, we know that well. In that case, it was the copyright treaty on which EU law was based. Thirdly, um, Lord Justice Arnold said, and he referred to the difficulty of it, effectively there are arguments that the court's got it wrong on communication to the public, but he respected the unrivaled experience of the Court of Justice in a range of factual scenarios, said it's developed and refined its jurisprudence, and while there are difficulties, we're not necessarily going to do any better. Um, there were fourth, fifth, and other points made, but the other one to draw attention to is the sixth point, um, which was probably the critical one, is the legal uncertainty that would prevail if one simply did unpick and throw up in the air um, all of the existing uh, jurisprudence. Um, interestingly, it's a bit of a footnote, in terms of that, that one post-Brexit case, um, the court found to be highly persuasive as a development of the law. Um, and I've noted there a more recent case, and it's the only one I've seen so far, where the Court of Appeal actually um, did not follow post-Brexit Court of Justice law, but on the basis that it didn't think it was consistent with previous Court of Justice um, law. That certainly would, in, in the old world, have led to a reference to the Court of Justice, but clearly we can't do that anymore. Um, so, on to the, the bill. Um, now, the, what's proposed in the bill is in three clauses, clauses 7, 8 and 9, that are particularly relevant to the court process. Um, the first point, really, to some extent, it restates what we already know, but it develops it. Um, a relevant appeal court says is not bound, so again, you've got this exception to we are bound by retained EU case law. Relevant appeal court being those higher courts, the Supreme Court or the Court of Appeal. Um, and then, obviously, if the law moves on, that may, that may be a, a, a difference. But instead of referring to the Supreme Court's test for overruling its own decisions, we get this. Um, the court is told, and I don't think it particularly likes being told what it must have regard to, but it's told that it must have regard to the fact that decisions of a foreign court are not, unless otherwise provided, binding. So it's foreign court. Um, I don't suppose many judges will think that's particularly persuasive. Um, any change of circumstances and the extent to which retained domestic case law restricts the proper development of domestic law. And that actually is drawn quite closely from that practice direction um, in the House of Lords. So we've got these, um, these provisions which seem to open the door a little bit more. Additionally, you've got a, a, a separate provision which is added um, that the court may depart from this domestic retained case law, and the, the reasons are similar. Interestingly, the explanatory notes on this 
and tell us, and it doesn't quite make sense to me, um, that this is done, these factors are chosen um, with the tune-in case in mind, but they don't look much like the factors in tune-in or to have the respect, the overt respect, that um, the Court of Appeal had to the cause of justice in that case. So we'll see um, where, where that goes. I don't actually think that the, court, the higher courts are likely to be tempted to change things without good reason because of those additional factors. But there's the opportunity for it. Now, the other procedures, because these are also quite important. Um, the Clause 7 introduces several new um, provisions or proposes to introduce them into the Withdrawal Act, allowing for references on retained uh, EU case law. Um, the first one is that one, sorry, it's lower courts may refer to higher courts. So if the problem spotted lower down, it can go up to that, either the Court of Appeal or the Appellate Court level or the Supreme Court fine. The second one is slightly newer, is a reference that law officers, so that's the Attorney General, um, etc., and the equivalents in uh, Northern Ireland, Scotland, and Wales, um, the law officers may make a reference uh, to the appellate court or the Supreme Court to decide a question. But this can't be done as part of proceedings. It's done when proceedings have ended, and presumably proceedings that the government, whichever government it might be, may have been involved in and may have lost. Um, so it's an interesting one. The court, at the moment, is given no discretion. It has to decide the question, and there's a possibly a safeguard to say any such decision does not affect the outcome of the proceedings mentioned. So said it doesn't affect the outcome of the proceedings, but given that a lot of proceedings are brought with a much bigger purpose in mind about the meaning of the law, um, that's hard to fathom how it might not, in many cases, affect the outcome of the proceedings where the opportunity was not taken possibly to run the point. So it's a slightly privileged position that um, government law officers are put in to re-argue points. And the third one um, is a point about interventions. Um, so, everybody's looking at me. I'll briefly mention this, and I hope this segues a little bit into what Maria is saying. But um, clauses eight and nine cover compatibility and incompatibility. And clause four, which is going outside my remit, but I want to mention it, um, sets out a principle of statutory interpretation that's quite important and I think quite radical. Um, it flips what we might know as the Marleasing principle, and it says that any provision of retained direct EU legislation, so that's direct regulations, etc., must be read in a way that's compatible with domestic enactments, all of them, new or old, wherever they come from, and is subject to all domestic enactments. enactments. Uh, so it sets up this compatibility question. To, um, what bolted on with that are incompatibility orders that I'll come to, but um, it's a very, very strong um, principle of, first of all, statutory interpretation, and secondly, statutory disapplication in favour of um, domestic law, wherever it comes from. Uh, it's subject to, and this is where I think the role of government in the interim gets even more difficult, Clause 8.2, which allows the national authority to preserve the supremacy of um, the European case law um, and over um, domestic uh, enactments. So you can preserve direct EU legislation and therefore domestic enactments would need to be read in light of the domestic um, EU, sorry, of the direct EU legislation. So that can be done, but clearly whether that's done, how it's done, it's going to take resources, time and effort and it all needs to be done pretty quickly. Thank you very much, Ned. Maria. Thank you very much. Now, I'm going to focus on Clause 4, Supremacy, and Clause 5, General Principles, um, in an environmental context. Um, before I start, I want to make three quick points, because I'm concerned that it is the bill in the round, rather than any particular detail, that raises our problems here. So first of all, as has become apparent this evening, we don't know exactly what the bill will do. 
Um, so some of the amendments that are being proposed in Parliament, so Stella Creasy, MP's proposed amendment, says that government must itemise the, the legislation that will be subject to sunset and that that list of provisions that will be subject to sunset can then be amended by Parliament. So you can imagine the sort of amendment that could take some of the surprise out of clause one but basically we don't yet know what this bill will do secondly i'm focusing on revocation and abolition i hope it goes without saying that the really broad powers granted to government until 2026 to change retained or assimilated law are deeply problematic Obviously, Clause 15, but even the relatively benign updating Clause 16 is problematic. And third, Clause 1, automatic repeal, no parliament, no consultation, no impact assessment. That is the background democratic and environmental difficulty. But even without sunset, um, even if, as Becky suggests, is going to happen, our key environmental law will be saved from sunset. We might quite properly breathe a sigh of relief, but the provisions I'm going to talk about mean that the ways in which we understand and apply environmental law could still change really significantly under the bill. So saving the legislation isn't going to be enough for us to know what happens in a year's time. So, I'll turn to supremacy. Um, the doctrine of the supremacy of EU law is abolished by Clause 4 of the Bill. Now, Section 5 of the EU Withdrawal Act had already sort of abolished um, supremacy, but the Withdrawal Act had retained supremacy in respect of legislation passed before the end of 2020. So, retained EU law currently enjoys supremacy over domestic legislation passed before the end of 2020. Domestic legislation passed before the end of 2020 is basically interpreted in line with retained EU law, including earlier EU law, and in principle could be held to be inapplicable because of a conflict. I think this is kind of supremacy light because legislation can now simply revoke any retained EU law. You know, so the, the, the main bit of supremacy is simply gone. Um, in principle, though, even the limited form of supremacy that survives is replaced by the bill with our normal approach to conflict between rules. So the later rule prevails, primary legislation prevails over secondary legislation, except for, as Ned said, in respect of direct retained EU law, so regulations or decisions reach for environmental lawyers. And there, Clause 4 introduces a reverse supremacy. Retained direct EU law must be, so far as possible, read and given effect to in a way compatible with all, including earlier in time, domestic enactments and then it's subject to this provision on incompatibility. UK reach is the obvious reverse supremacy case for environmental lawyers. So there's another job for Becky's team, which is to carefully go through reach and work out the extent to which its meaning will change in a year's time if this bill is passed. Beyond direct retained EU law, we might think about supremacy and planning. So planning law is dense, it's really difficult, it's extensive, it's dynamic. Most years we get a new piece of primary legislation. But that primary legislation has always been subject to environmental assessment and habitats regulations. Since Brexit, new planning acts, like the Leveling Up and Regeneration Bill, which we're not calling a planning act, but which is a planning act, New planning acts can overturn environmental assessment and habitats regulations, okay, but, but they do it clearly and expressly. Removing supremacy has the potential to reopen the debate about the meaning of legislation, even in the absence of new 
targeted legislation. Okay. I'm not saying there is an incompatibility, but I am saying I don't know whether there's an incompatibility and that we're opening up the possibility of relitigating hard won and basically just taken for granted legal clarity. And remember also that most incompatibilities are just a misunderstanding or a mistake. It's, it's quite, I mean, and that might be complacency, it might be going really close to the wire on minimal implementation, but, but it's generally an, an error rather than a carefully thought through, thwarted policy objective. That's not really what we're talking about with supremacy. So there's lots of um, problems of clarity here. And the difficulty isn't removing the doctrine of supremacy. I think removing the doctrine of supremacy is, is inevitable um, after Brexit. The problem is that we're doing it all in one go without government, parliament or anybody else carefully going through our legislation to think about the future application of environmental law. Um, clause 8, as Ned mentioned, grants government the power until 23rd of June 2026 to reinstate supremacy in respect of specified domestic legislation and specified direct EU legislation. In order to use that safeguard, really, which is what it is, in order to use that safeguard, Government departments really do need to know exactly what they're dealing with in some real detail. Okay, I'll turn next to the general principles. Clause 5 of the bill will abolish the general principles of EU law. Section 5 of the Withdrawal Act had retained the general principles, albeit for the purposes of interpretation only. So I'll, I'll mention the decision in Harrison Environment Agency, which was on Ned's slides. Um, this was a successful judicial review of the scope of the Environment Agency's investigation into the impact of water abstraction on protected habitats. In determining the appropriate remedy, the High Court referred to the right to an effective remedy in EU law as a retained general principle of EU law. So it used the general principle of effective remedies to shape, to support its granting of a remedy in this case. Now there's no list of general principles of EU law. Effective remedies is one of them. Many of the things that are definitely on the list can also be found in the common law, due process, legitimate expectations. Importantly for thinking about the future, the High Court in Harris refers, as well as to the EU general principle, Harris refers to a presumptive common law entitlement to an effective remedy. There's also a Court of Appeal decision saying something similar. Um, so there's this presumptive common law principle. Now, more legal uncertainty but perhaps we are going to see more reliance on the common law to do the work that was being done by the general principles of EU law. Effective remedies have been utterly crucial to environmental litigation. Okay. In Harris, the High Court also applied the precautionary principle as a retained general principle of EU law. This picks up on a single case before the EU courts, and it's the only principle that could fall in this category. The EU general principle of precaution applies to decision makers like the Environment Agency, as well as to ministers. It's much more demanding than things we've seen domestically around precaution recently. If the general principles go, under this bill, that route for interpreting habitats and other bits of EU law goes. Again, it's important to note that even if our habitats and species regs are saved from repeal, 
a really core part of their interpretation and their day-to-day -day application, not just in the courts, but the administrative process, is going to be sunsetted. Even if the legislation is saved, and Becky tells us that that's the plan, we are going to have to think again about the application and the interpretation of the law in a year's time. Okay. We do want some time for questions, so I'll leave restatement. There is some restatement around supremacy and principles, and I'll conclude. Um, essentially, even without Clause 1 and Clause 15, we are changing the ways in which we understand and apply a vast body of law, and that is no small thing. And that will be the case even if our most precious legislation survives. I can't imagine how bit by bit amendment of the bill is going to get us out of this bind. It's the disorderly and the unpredictable nature of the bill as a whole that creates our challenges here. And I'll leave it there. Thank you, Eloise. Thank you very much, Maria. Um, just before I turn to questions, I kind of want to just zoom us out a, a, a little bit more on the kind of big themes. So we've got into the detail, but we've got more constitutional unorthodoxy, more challenges of legal certainty, um, risks to environmental protection, I think. I think a couple of other things I'd throw into the basket are there's a real, you know, today's session is about focusing on the bill and the environment and environmental law. There's a conceptual challenge about the bill in environmental law, which comes through the large numbers of pieces of legislation. And the reason why there's so many pieces of legislation is that the predominant source of domestic environmental law is EU environmental law. Mm. So it makes something like Clause 4, where you're interpreting, trying to interpret in line with domestic law, seem a complete oddity. It's a reversal of actually the construction of our body of law. If we take the point that the Environment Act is meant to move us on into a new post-Brexit kind of um, world of environmental law, that's part of the answer, but it raises a different problem, and a problem of um, fragmentation of our body of environmental law. We've, all, we've had a problem of fragmentation of our EU, um, UK environmental law for some time, but it is going, again, to kind of a, a different level. Um, our new Environment Act, which is very exciting, was created and has been premised on the fact that retained EU law would continue to exist. Our environment targets build upon the fact that we are retaining all of our uh, uh, retained EU law. Um, so, and there are many more dimensions in which we have complexity and fragmentation. Vivian uh, explained them beautifully in relation to devolution. Um, I think the fact that also we haven't touched on today, um, there are different processes for amending retained EU law after this. We have this bill which is the flagship, we have provisions in the levelling up regeneration bill, apparently we have a planning and infrastructure bill which will also allow us in another way to yet again uh, amend retained EU law. This is, this is not just confusion, this is really harming the certainty of our um, body of law. Maybe the incompatibility provisions of the, of the bill will, will get us there if it all gets in too much of a mess. Um, but we could talk about this for hours. I'm going to open this up for questions from the floor. I have some questions online. One of the questions online, which is very nice, does say, are the panels being too polite? Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> I, anyway, I'll come to that. So, not polite. Actually, I'll come to William first, because you are, were asking, your, had your hand up for a long time, and I'll come to you, sir. Yeah. Thanks very much. It's, it's William Wilson. Um, I'll just take one example and see whether I've misunderstood it. Um, the pesticide residues in foods. Uh, is supported by three pieces of retained EU law. Um, we know we've got a problem because more than half of all bread contains multiple pesticides. If these provisions were revoked, what would replace them by what procedure and based on what expertise? Um, we understand from what you've all said on the panel that there's no meaningful participation by Parliament. There's no public participation at all. There's probably not time to consult anybody who knows what they're talking about. Uh, but ministers can legislate at will in the environmental field, in, we're told by the Secretary of State, about 1,100 uh, areas of environmental law, which would be taken by an internal star chamber uh, meeting in February or March this year. How, how will that work in practice? 
Appreciate Very good question. Um, I, I will repeat the questions after I gather them. So, next question. Uh, Nigel Haig, IEP. Uh, I would dearly love to hear somebody telling me which EU environmental legislation they would wish to be revoked. It's actually a piece of uh, red tape, but it's unnecessary. And I do have some knowledge of EU environmental law, so I'm going to offer one example. And that is the warm uh, noise for it. Now, uh, if the DOE officials are looking through their list, saying, well, look, we must revoke some, otherwise we won't, we must give some red meat to the Brexiteers in the Parliament. And I said, we must put some few in that to be revoked in. And the noise, the warm uh, noise directive, I offer. <laughs> is an example. There's a huge body of EU environmental legislation which concerns product standards, which have two purposes. One, to protect the environment, and two, to make trade within the EU easy. Um, and there is a normal manufacturing industry in the UK which exports to the EU and would want to have that directive retained so they could put the CE mark on and sell it into the EU. The UK government wants to abolish the CE bar to its French, it stands for Conformité Européenne, and replace it with the UK CA mark, UK Conformité yep. Assured. So there has to be, if it's going to be UK Conformité Assured, there must be some UK law to be assured of. So they would have to replace it with another noise directly, which could be the same standard, or could be a lower one, though that would make it difficult to send it to the EU. So this directive has got to be looked at from the point of view of the environment, from the point of view of trade. So would it be looked at both by Zephra and by Base? I don't know the answer to that. But I come back to my first question. Has anybody got candidates for revoking? Thank you. I'm going to take one more and then I'm going to put them all together. Fiela. Yeah. <coughs> so Fiela Lesniewska, UCL. I really, um, there's two points. <coughs> I'm not a fan of this law. Because, um, <laughs> um, I wasn't, I wasn't swayed by Becky's um, <laughs> insights of what's going on in Deborah. It sounds like almost it's like Noah's Ark, and <coughs> bit by bit. Every piece of environmental law has been looked at and it's either going to be allowed to go into the ark or it's not. And that's completely against where we've got to or where we're trying to get to with environmental law, which is much more around a sort of ecosystem approach, uh, recognising the interconnections. It's not about keystone solutions, it's about the ecosystem within which laws are necessary to protect the ecosystem, the ecosystem functions, the interconnections, including moving towards net zero. Chris Skidmore picked it up yesterday in the review. And even the way it's even been spoken about in the process is so appalling. It, 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 it puts us back in the dark ages. Um, and the second question I had, we've got to put in motivation. Uh, the second one was in the Scotland EU Continuity Act, it does say that they will align with their regulations with the EU, with the EU law, which they're trying to do now, um, like with the Circular Economy Bill. Um, so what will happen? Will it end up as a Supreme Court conflict? Yeah. Ed? Are we going, what are we going to end up with? Um, is it going to be a little bit like sort of the, the, what's going on with um, the Trans Act? In Scotland. We're going to have a problem with inequity, environmental law in Scotland versus everywhere else. Thanks so much. Um, I'm going to repeat those questions um, and then suggest you might answer them. First, from William Wilson, uh, raising the example of pes pesticides control. There's three pieces of retained EU law that do that job. If they were to be removed, how, how would they be replaced? Um, to cover that field, what would be the process, what would be the expertise? Um, I might direct that to, to, to you, Jake. Mm -hmm. um, then mm -hmm. Nigel's question about 
um, which piece of EU environmental legislation might the panel like to revoke? Um, he's given an example, but said even in the example that he would suggest, you'd have to consider it from multiple perspectives, the lawnmower noise directive, from an environmental perspective, from a trade perspective, and so on. Um, that's a challenge, I think. Fiea's question is, there's something kind of problematic about the process in the retained EU law bill, it, in, it, in it doesn't kind of uh, f facilitate seeing environmental laws holistically. I think that's the, that, that, that's the gist of it, um, when in, environmental law is about um, ultimately dealing with something that is very interconnected, which is our natural environment. Um, I want to throw in one from online as well, which is from Andy Jordan, which might be good for you, Maria, I think. Um, uh, retaining the EU law is only half the battle. Any retained EU uh, law will also have to be updated over time, query to prevent it regressing and implemented. Who or what is overseeing those things once you get past the moment of saving, I think. Um, and Ned, you might like to answer any of those or potentially the question of are we coming for another, another huge constitutional challenge between what the Scottish Government wants to do in, under the Continuity Act and what might happen um, under the Rural Bill. It's a very hypothetical question, but it does feel like there is something there. Um. Yeah, sure. Um, very good question. Um, I think I'd start by saying, first of all, I should probably out myself and say I worked in government for 10 years as well. I should have mentioned that in my blurb. Um, so I'm speaking partly with that sort of that recollection in mind. There are, as you know, I'm sure, established procedures for policy and lawmaking, are there not? Um, I think the difficulty with the rule bill is it throws those procedures up in the air um, and those norms. There's no assurance they're going to be followed here because there's nothing in the bill that says they will be. Um, so I think there is a very real question. I don't have a simple answer to your uh, question. It seems to me, given the breadth of the powers in the bill, if you allow something that's retained to you law to lapse, you've got this incredibly wide power to do other stuff um, uh, in the bill. Um, so whatever replaces it is likely to be regulations. Um, again, to go back to my established procedures point, presumably in a normal course of events, those would be consulted on but is there time? And in between time, in between the end of this year and whenever you go through a proper process and enact your new regs, we're going to be in a black hole. I, 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 can't, I, I don't think I can put it any other way. And that is clearly hugely undesirable, hence I think the assurances again that we've, we've heard this evening. Maria? Um, thanks for the question, um, Andy. It's um, nice to hear people are online. Um, so th the questions about updating and implementation and, and all the other things we need to be doing. And it's true, we've just been firefighting for six years and that has been um, sapping of energy and intellectual ideas and all of the things that we really should have been doing and the things that we should be talking about tonight because we shouldn't be talking about this. Um, so we have been firefighting um, and there are lots of exciting and routine things that we should be doing around implementation of the stuff we've got and around working out the new things that we need to respond to our environmental challenges. But all of the new things that we're being promised rely upon a stable regulatory context to work. So, you know, you think about, you know, net biodiversity gain in planning. That's a fabulous idea if it sits in the context of a stable regulatory regime. If it sits in the context of a completely deregulated planning law and no habitats protection, it's, it's a terrible degradation of our legal um, system. So, I mean, it, it's a very pertinent question and we continue to firefight and I hope we get a moment to reflect and move forward um, sometime soon. Um, I, uh, there's a few points that haven't been covered. I mean, they're maybe the difficult ones. That's what I, I don't practice devolution law. I don't, I don't know how that would work. But I did think when Stanley asked his question earlier, if, uh, if you're thinking how this might end up before the Supreme Court, that's probably the route. Um, go up to Edinburgh, let's have a think about it. There might be a route for that. I, I don't know because um, I just don't know the ins and outs of that area of law, but we're, we're seeing a nice case study with the, um, the current um, turmoil over the transgender bill, so we'll see about that. What um, bits of EU law are useless and maybe should fall away? I'm sure there's plenty. Um, 
I don't come across my desk necessarily. The lawnmower noise directive sounds to me like something that's probably formulated in a different context and lawnmowers don't make that kind of noise anymore. And I think in the environmental context, most of the time when we find, it might be 1970s, 80s, even 1990s environment laws that might be useless now, it's simply because technology's moved on, because we've moved on, how we live has changed. So those bits of law are probably as useless for the EU as they are for us, and there's lots of them. So uh, whether there's enough that we can start thinking that it's not a monumental task, I don't know. Um, on case law, I think there are some interesting areas where clearly EU law could be improved and where the UK courts have rightly criticised EU law. And the two that stand out fairly well, to me anyway, are fairly well-known examples, the inter-environmental case about strategic environmental assessment um, and how that's extended, so required by legislation, is extended to... Um, include things that are not required at all um, and certainly in my practice I've seen examples of SEAs being carried out for documents that are so vague that you can't meaningfully assess them um, and that's because of a certain application of, of strategic environmental assessment. I think that could be done better, not get rid of it but I think it could be done better and, it, and waste law is another one, I, that whole line of CJEU cases where Robert Carnworth ended up at the end of his tether and said, this is all hopeless, I'm not even going to refer it because they don't, no one knows what this law is supposed to be. Mm -hmm. um, so there's clearly scope for improvement, and I expect there is a bit of scope for some spring cleaning, maybe even some major spring cleaning, but um, that's not what this bill is about. We've had, um, thank you, we've had one suggestion online for Nigel's challenge. <laughs> um, the list of waste regulations emanating from the EWC. It imposes an unhelpful and burdensome system to classify all waste to the nth degree. There you go. Um, but I think, do we have any other burning questions? Or people, I think people look a little bit like this is a lot to take in. <laughs> yeah, it is a lot. Um, and as I said, we could have gone more, but I suggest we do more over a drink upstairs. You have to climb the stairs to earn your drink, as well as... There is a lift. Oh, I take a lift um, out that door. But once you get to the first floor in the hub, there will be refreshments um, and we can continue the conversation. Then. I, I, thank you to the panel.